Welcome to you this morning. It's good to be here with you. Um, just a reminder, Tuesday, October 4, we're having a call meeting. Uh, I guess we're going to call a pastor, try to do that. So everybody should be there for that. We begin with the opening hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God, we confess that we are our nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you, we have sinned against you, we have sinned Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. Let your mercy come to me that I may live. 
for your law is my delight. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. the strength of all who put who trust in you and without your aid we can do no good thing grant us the help of your grace that we may please you in both will and deed through Jesus Christ your son our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Lord. 
The epistle is from 1 Timothy chapter 3. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their, old house, their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rise for the gospel. said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs>
mercy and peace be unto you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this morning is taken from the 16th chapter of St. Luke, which has already been read. Please be seated. You know, the rich man, the rich man was not a Christian. How do you know that the rich man was not a Christian? Well, there are a couple clues that indicate that the rich man was not a Christian. And then there's one conclusive piece of, piece of evidence for sure. This man is not a Christian. But Lazarus, he was a Christian, right? And how do we know that Lazarus was a Christian? Don't you just love it when people tell you what you think? I know I do. I don't think of myself as an expert on many things. I'm a good Googler. I can back up a truck and, of course, TV. But I do think myself to be the expert on the subject of what I think. What about you? Is that how you are too? It's especially annoying when somebody tells you what you think and they're wrong. I don't know about anybody else, but I have been told that you Christians, you Christians just don't care about what happens here on this planet in this life. You Christians, all you care about is heaven. That's what I've been told, I think. So I googled it, and an article comes up uh, when, um, when American Christians stopped caring about others. The article was written by a Christian pastor. He's wrong. But that's about it. Mostly, we are told that we don't care about the planet. And that's all over the place. On the entire internet, there are actually not that many people telling us that we don't care about other people. It's kind of a hard case to make, I think. I don't do Twitter. I'm not talking about the other social media. I'm talking about things that are thought out and explained in a cogent manner. What we are mostly told by a lot of people that we don't care about the planet. Because all we care about is heaven. Last time I checked, the two biggest polluters in the world are China and India. The Christian church is growing in both of those places, but neither country you would say are Christian. China has been atheist. It's kind of a requirement of communism. Karl Marx is the one who said that religion is the opiate of the masses. India, mostly Hindu. Some Sikhs and Muslims. Christianity is in the minority in India, and they're often persecuted. What has come to be known as the environmental movement started in Christian countries. And I remember I was there for the first Earth Day at Thomas Edison Junior High School, April 22, 1970. And I don't know if you can say that caring about and for the planet is a uniquely Christian thing, but we learn early on in Genesis that God made it all that he made it all for us to use, and that he put us in charge of taking care of it, and we do. I think that maybe some people have taken it a little bit too far, maybe. And of course that thing too has become politicized, and when science becomes politicized, it's not really <coughs> science, it's more like politics. But I'm not gonna talk about politics here, I'm a pastor. The theology of it is that in the flood, God destroyed almost all living beings that he had created. He put a rainbow in the sky to remind us that he's never going to do that again. And the end will come when God himself decides it's time to destroy this earth with fire, his creation with fire, and make a new heaven and a new earth. That's how this thing is going to end, theologically. 
So that's your first clue that the rich man, are we going to talk, is he going to talk about money again? That the rich man was not a Christian by the way he acted toward Lazarus. And by that, I mean the rich man did not act toward Lazarus. Or, like another man we thought of, saw a few weeks ago, he thought about a lot of things during the day the rich man did. Helping Lazarus was not one of the things he thought about ever. And that's not a very Christian thing, is it? Looks like he lived in what we would call a gated community. Because the storyteller Jesus talks about a gate, which means that there was probably a fence, and the fence is there to keep out the riffraff, like Lazarus. Not that Lazarus wanted a lot. He was not high maintenance. He was not asking to be allowed into the compound to dine with the family who lived in luxury every day. We would say they partied hard every day. Lazarus, he just wanted to be allowed to paw through the garbage that nobody else wanted anyway. This parable is about contrast. And while the rich man partied hard every day, the only comfort mentioned, the only attention paid to Lazarus is the dogs. The dogs licked his sores. Ulcerated skin is what we're talking about here. It's a symptom, maybe caused by poor circulation. I'm not a doctor, but I'm thinking maybe malnutrition can cause those kinds of sores. Actually, the first clue that the man is not a Christian is that he's a rich man. He's a rich man. And when Jesus tells a story involving a rich man, probably he's not going to be the good guy. The rich man is probably going to play the villain, which is actually true except when he doesn't. In parables where the rich man is not the bad man, perhaps he's a good man, God is often in the stories Jesus tells portrayed as a rich man. So, there's nothing wrong with being rich. And if you think that having wealth keeps you from heaven and earns you a trip to hell, then you need to dispose of that wealth and do it right away. Me, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe that. And I do understand that I can't take it with me. To be sure, wealth can be, often is a distraction. But you know what? If you don't have a stock portfolio, you probably don't even care what happened in the market this week. Oh, so if you're going to tell me that it's okay to have wealth, Go ahead and talk about money every Sunday, Pastor. We don't really have class in this country. And by that I mean the nobility, you know, that sort of thing. The Constitution of the United States eliminates the, the class system. They put on a nice funeral for, for Elizabeth, didn't they? Nice funeral? No, I did not get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. To watch it. And yes, I would have t voted it, but you may have heard that I fired the dish, it's in the basement. But I got a DVR that can record off the antenna. So six hours of coverage, we hit the highlights, the parts in church. I don't care about them driving around, the parts in church. It was a pretty traditional funeral, sounded a lot like a Lutheran funeral. So how did the royals get to be the royals? The larger question is how, in any given society, some people come to dominate over other people, and that's what we call the class system, especially when it continues generationally. The simple answer is that in the beginning, whoever is bigger, stronger, smarter, that's how class develops. They become the nobility of that group of people. And the man who often could afford the best horses, weapons, and become the best warrior became the leader, and that's how nobility gets started. Passed down from generation to generation, and maybe after a few generations, 
the nobility is not very strong, smart, or big. Most of the European countries have gotten rid of the royals. Ah, you lose a world war. England has won her world wars. You're welcome. And the gap between the wealthy, that's the queen and the rest, in England and the poor, it's a big gap. Compare and contrast. It's not just about owning huge swathes of land, which they do, and castles, which they do, and real estate in London, and they have a portfolio, and they are living large. The new king has access to the best education, the best health care, and some political power. The gap between the rich man and Lazarus would have been much like that gap. It's a big gap. The rich man was born into, and you could see that that was never going to change. Like many societies of that time and many remain today, the rich man had assets, including land, money, education, the best health care money could buy, and there wasn't really much of a middle class. It was either or. He thought himself to be the better of the common man, Lazarus, and so did most of the people in that society. Lazarus. He was born into nothing. And in this life, he was never going to have, never going to be anything. Well, we got rid of that from the get-go. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. We got rid of that. It's in the Constitution. I have a copy of my great-grandfather Banks Peter's citizenship papers. Quote, his citizenship papers say, he probably had to take class or something, he's permitted to take the oath to support the Constitution of the United States and the usual oath whereby he renounced all allegiance and fidelity to every foreign prince potentate, state, and sovereign, and more particularly to Oscar II, King of Sweden, whereof he was here to fork a subject. And that's kind of the way it works here, isn't it? I don't think many of us even think in terms of class or nobility. It's just not our thing. We tend to not want to have things given to us, whether a title of nobility or cash, but we prefer to, you know, Elon Musk is from South Africa. He emigrated to Canada because it was easy, and so he could enter America more easily. He wanted to make money, he builds cars and rockets, and he's very wealthy. And that's an American thing, but he's never going to be Sir Elon. And like many of the new rich, Elon Musk is not a Christian. He makes no claim to be a Christian, and it shows Steve Jobs, the Apple guy. You may, maybe haven't heard this. He started out as a Lutheran in Wisconsin, and Steve Jobs ended up Buddhist. That's not a good look for eternity. Zuckerberg and the rest of them. Not many dot-com billionaires seem to be Christians. We talked last week about Andrew Carnegie, the steel guy. He and the other robber barons who never robbed anybody. Rockefeller was a Baptist. Vanderbilt, the train guy, was a Moravian and the like. And I personally, I personally know lots of people who are fairly wealthy and many of them are good Christians. The Medici of the 14th century Florence, the inventors of modern capitalism, and by that I mean banking, were Christians. Joseph of Arimathea loaned his tomb to Jesus. He was a Christian. The late queen and the nobility and the common people as well in the Middle Ages, most of them Christians. Our new American nobility, 
lot of them also. Tim Tebow, you know, was a Christian. Philip Rivers, Kobe Bryant, Albert Pujols, Adam Wainwright. He grew up down the street from Harper's dad. They're all Christians. It can happen. But they don't pass that down to the next generation. No title anyway. And then comes for both of these people in this story, the second great equalizer. Time came, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. And that's how we know that the rich man was not a Christian. He went to hell. And it's how we know that Lazarus was a Christian. He went to heaven, to Abraham's bosom. In Old Testament language, a place of comfort, and oh, Abraham's there in heaven as well. So, there is nothing inherently wrong with being rich. There is something wrong with not being a Christian. And the wrong is that it lands you in hell for eternity, and that's a long time. The first great equalizer is Christian baptism. You become a Christian, you keep the faith, you get into heaven, the same heaven as the rest of the Christians. Rich, poor, in between, you get your own room in the same house, and everybody's going to be wearing a crown. Everybody. Compare and contrast. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. That word torment, we would use the word torture. He looked up and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus had his side, so he called him Father Abraham. So why do some preachers avoid or even refuse to talk about hell? And they do. This isn't the only time the Bible talks about hell. And it's not like it's an obscure point of theology. It's a very fundamental and important thing, isn't it? Hell. Well, some of them just don't believe the Bible. So they believe hell to be an archaic concept. They might even tell you that modern man is too smart to believe those things. And it's not a pleasant topic, is it? Not a pleasant topic. Facebook friend, a pastor, was quoting the church fathers, the contrast between heaven and hell. Heaven is life and living, constant life and living, and we do like to live. Hell, do you like to die? Do you want to die? Do you look forward to death? Probably not. Hell is constant death, but never death. Or as this guy puts it, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Hell has also been compared, like here, to being constantly on fire, never consumed. And who wants that? And who wants to hear about that anyway? And the problem is that heaven actually exists, and you want to go there, and so does hell, and you don't want to go there. And once you get to the one, there's no crossing over to the other. Abraham answered, son, remember that in your lifetime, you did all right. While Lazarus, not so much. But now, he is comforted here, and you are in agony, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from one to another can't. 
And the other problem, it's kind of a practical thing, I think, people who don't think there's a hell also don't think that there are eternal consequences that when it's over, it's over and they're home free. Uh, that guy up in Makokita who murdered three people, then he murdered himself. Do you think he thought that at the moment of death he was going to go to hell for eternity? And every time you see one of those mass shootings, ask yourself, does this person think there's a hell? Is he afraid of going to hell? That's the practical problem with not talking about. Finally, lastly, that appeal from the man in hell to the man in heaven, can you send a warning to my brothers? It would be, Abraham says, a wasted trip. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead, and they weren't. So, you think that just because the Bible says something, like about heaven and hell, you think that I should believe what it says. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they do know what I'm thinking. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And she's Your mercies are new unto us every morning. And though we have not deserved your goodness, you abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness towards us. Give thanks for all your benefits and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, Look with favor upon your servants, Kevin, Lexi, the family of Percy, Liz, Walt, Brent, Jeff, Alan, Sherry, Ruth, Lola, Lori, Cindy, Marcia, Miranda, Kathy, Richard, Jean, Tyler, Norma, and Brian. Assure them of your mercy. Deliver them from the temptations of the evil one and give them patience and comfort in their illnesses. If it please you, restore them to health or give them grace to accept these tribulations with courage and hope through Jesus Christ our Lord.
with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, are you Lord of heaven and earth for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior with repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus we beg you O Lord to forgive renew and strengthen us with your word and spirit Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.